What's the connection between food and Bitcoin? That's what we're going to be finding out today. Welcome to CoinGeek Conversations, coming to you from London and from New York, where my guest is Brian Choi, who is the CEO of the Food Institute. So welcome, Brian. Thanks, Charles. I'm uh, honored to, to be interviewed by you. Well, thank you very much. You're listening to CoinGeek Conversations with Charles Miller. Let me start by asking you, what exactly is the Food Institute? I know it's a very venerable institution that's been going for almost 100 years, but it's actually not a fusty old institution as, as perhaps the name or my preconceptions might have guessed. Tell me about your involvement with it. So the Food Institute actually started in 1928 by a broker in the food industry. And he started it with the intention of providing basic news about certain products or pricing information and making that available to other members of the food industry. And you know, over the years, it evolved, it grew. The report uh, really became, uh, at that time, it was the only, it was the go-to place where, you know, if you want to know anything about what's happening in the corn market, in the hog market, in different sort of uh, food commodities, that was a place that you go. You go to the Food Institute, you, you get the report on a weekly basis. And so, um, you know, I, I got involved with the company um, actually about five years ago when I became a subscriber. You know, at that time I was, I was doing investment banking, I was in private equity. I wanted to know where I can go to get unbiased news, great content, and informed content you know, as a food industry professional. And the Food Institute was one of the places that I would go. It's a, an authoritative news agency, a news provider then. Correct, correct. And that's, that's the main part of what, what we do. Um, and when I took it, took it over in 2020, it was to build that and expand upon the, that sort of authoritative news, provide, uh, interviews with CEOs of, of food businesses and or investors in, in the space that can provide expert commentary on what's what's happening in, in the food space. And so I liken it to becoming like, you know, in, in into now, it's really the Bloomberg of the food industry. Um, and so you have the news component, you have the digital media component, you have the data component all coming together in one place in, in from agriculture to food manufacturing to food processing to food retail to food service. The one stop, the one hub where you can get the information that you need to, to help you be informed about your business. The Food Institute, it sounds like some kind of public body, but in fact, it's gone from being a, a public nonprofit to a commercial. How did it make the transition and when did it make the transition to being a, a, a commercial organization? It became, that transition happened, I want to say about three years ago, where uh, a few high net worth individuals, they, they, they liked the content um, and they wanted to make some changes. And, and so they, they acquired it, they bought the, the, um, um, the rights to the, to the brand name. And at that point, really nothing changed you know, for, for another uh, you know, 24 months. Um, because they, they didn't have the right leader <laughs> in, in, at that time. And then you came and along. So, and then I, I saw the opportunity. And, and I, I didn't know the, the, the owners at the time, but I, f I found out who they were. And I just reached out to them through, through social media. And I, I, I pestered them for probably about six months until, until they got sick of me and fi decided to, to, take my, to take my call. And I introduced myself and I, I basically told them, long story short, what I wanted to do. And then three months later, I acquired the company. Well, that's great. Well, that takes us right to where we are today. So perhaps you could explain what is your business model for the company and in particular, how Bitcoin fits into it. Sure. So... You know, as I mentioned, you know, um, uh, a minute ago, you know, the, the vision is to really continue to build this into becoming the industry, food industry hub, where whether you're a 
food industry executive, whether you're a private equity individual, whether you're in venture capital, you want to know what's happening in the food industry. So we've been growing quite rapidly over the six, you know, the, the past 16 months since I took over. Um, and a lot of our content is geared towards what's, what's going to impact the food industry, right? A lot of our content is about up and coming trends. Obviously, we've done a lot on on you know plant based. What's happening? You know, we have a w webinar next week on the rise of insect protein, which is the, you know the next generation of of uh, alternative uh, you know protein. Alongside that, the techno technological changes that are impacting the food industry also come into play. You know, artificial intelligence. You know, uh, uh, for example. Um, payment processing as another example, leveraging data to, to help businesses be better informed about uh, what consumers are doing. And this is where blockchain really comes into play. And so, yeah, you know, I, last year I reached out to, to Jimmy and, and, and to Stefan. Jimmy Wynn, now host of the CoinGeek uh, conference. That's correct. And I wanted to um, have them introduce blockchain to our audience, which you know primarily represents you know most you know food industry uh, middle market companies directly related to the management level. Just to clarify for people, you don't speak to the in individual consumer. You are professional. You address professionals, and that they pay a, a decent uh, subscription for the information that you provide. Right. So, so part of it is, is sub subscription based. Part of it is advertising based. So we have banners. We we have a few advertisers through our our digital media. We also have an advisory component. So, given my background in investment banking consulting, um, I spend a lot of time helping advise companies strategically and how they should be um, shifting. Pivoting uh, their their business strategy. Well, just getting back to what you said about uh, introducing your audience to a Bitcoin, Bitcoin SV in particular, you invited Jimmy Wynn and Stefan to address them. How did that go down? It was very well received. I think you know um, the the feedback that I got was that they they found the content to be um, you know, it was basically a Bitcoin 101. <laughs> Which is, you know, not many people really uh, really understand blockchain, let alone cryptocurrency. And so, for them, it wasn't about trying to, you know, it wasn't about oh BTC versus Ethereum versus Litecoin. It was about okay, what is blockchain, and what are the specific use cases that food industry, in, you know, uh, food companies can can apply to, towards their business. So it was great. You know, it was well received. There were a lot of questions, and I think um, the plan is. I want to invite Jimmy and, and, and Stefan back uh, for round two, where they, you know, companies like Unisant and Seafood Chain can explain what, you know, what are the, the the next generation of applications that food, you know, food companies can can use, you know, in uh, for for blockchain. I would think that Stefan Nilsson would be a terrific um, example because his uh, initial work with Unisant was with the Norwegian salmon industry, wasn't it? Correct. I guess that would be a terrific way of interesting people in the food industry in general, in how supply chains could be uh, could be helped. That's correct. So, do you see this being a major uh, change for the food industry? Will will we see mass adoption of these technologies, or what are the problems about that going forward? Do you think? I do. I do think that there. Are will be a massive transformation on all parts of the food industry as it relates to um, leveraging data, using technology, artificial intelligence. It's already started, right? So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. On the AI front, you have companies like Tyson, um, JBS, two of the largest meat processors in the world, and they've used um, technology, software, software and you know, robotics to replicate deboning certain types of, um, you know, whether it's cows, whether it's pigs, or you know, a poultry, and the the efficiency of these robotics are on par with human human workers. 
And, and so especially, you know, when, when we're reflecting upon COVID-19 and you're getting a lot of um, plant workers sick and, and infecting others, leveraging this, this sort of technology becomes vital, right? And so we're seeing mass adoption of, of new software, new robotics. Now, I think blockchain is a part of that. Right. I, th I think blockchain is a part of that. It, it has sort of lagged in, in, in its development because I think there still has to be a lot more education about what it is and the specific use cases. But I, I do think that it's gonna, it will continue to be adopted more and more. One of the things that we see in society as a whole at the moment is an increasing interest in sustainability and environmental problems and so on. And I imagine that if anything, those concerns are part of the food industry more than other industries. Is that going to help promote the kind of accountability that blockchain could provide for supply chains, do you think? Absolutely, no, no question. We've already started to see um, the adoption of the whole ESG movement, environmental sustainable governance, right? So co when companies like Coke and PepsiCo they are putting a stake in the ground and they're saying, okay, by, by 2030, we're going to be carbon neutral or by you know, 2025, we're going to um, uh, use 50% less water. Um, so companies have already started to, to make, you know, put a stake in the ground like that. Um, and blockchain is one of the key ways, I think, that that level of accountability um, you know, uh, can be monitored, right? So it's one thing, as you, as you know, Charles, it's one thing to say something like, oh, we're gonna be carbon neutral by 2030. It's another thing to say, okay, here are the facts. This is the data, this is what we've done, and having it transparent to, to everyone and easily verifiable, which is what blockchain is able to do. Yeah, because in a way, I think if you look at the kind of vision that Stefan Nilsson has, what's great about it is that the efficiency and the accountability kind of go hand in hand. And from the point of view of sustainability or knowing where my food has come from, which is kind of related to that, I suppose, everything is pointing in the same direction rather than having to make a choice between efficiency and those other concerns. Correct, yeah, 100% agree. So I'm hoping more companies like Unisat and Seafood Chain, you know, be come to the forefront because I think, you know, um, we're still a long ways away for, for this technology to be adopted by, by the masses. And um, the more entrepreneurs are leveraging the BSV uh, blockchain and developing applications, that's only gonna help um, foster uh, adoption, which is, which is my hope, so. I'm interested in the, the job that you have carved out for yourself here because it seems, a very complicated one because you're running a big business, the Food Institute, but you are also having to be an expert on the content of this business in terms of Bitcoin and all the other robotics and whatever. I mean, it, it, <laughs> you must be a busy man, I think. Yeah, we're definitely short staffed. We need a lot more people. We're hoping to hire a lot more people next year. What is the, what is the staff? How many staff do you have roughly, do you know? Well, we, we started the year with, with seven, um, but now we're at 11, 12, sorry. We're at 12 currently. And then next year, uh, potentially double that. Um, so we, we, we received some investment capital from a, from a private equity firm and to help us fund that growth. But you're right. But you're right, Charles. Like it's you know to be on top of all the various trends that are impacting food from farm to fork, and to to have a level of understanding uh, to share that share that type of content with our audience is is a tremendously difficult task. And so I'm hoping to hire some <laughs> some more experts to help join my team next year. So if you have if you know anyone, just let me know. <laughs> Finally, I have to ask you, are you and your team um, gourmets? Do, or do you cook or do you love going to restaurants or is food just another industry as far as you and your colleagues are concerned or is it a love of food that drives your, your work? It's both. 
it, it, it's both. So I'm not a great cook, but my wife Susan, she she's she's a wonderful cook, and so she's she's always teaching me about about different types of food. I love going to restaurants and seeing just how creative chefs can be with food, right? So one example, 11 Madison Park being one of the best restaurants in the world, Daniel Hum, he converted his entire menu to be a vegan menu this year. Uh, and for a you know, three star, three Michelin star restaurant um, and as you know, a uh, high profile of a chef as Daniel Hum, you know, is to do that. It's it sends a, not only a statement, but you're almost wondering, like, wow, like, are people really going to pay four hundred dollars for vegetables? <laughs> do we know whether it was a a good move from a business point of view or not yet? It's still early. Uh, so he he announced it. I want to probably say like four or five months ago. So I think we'll, we'll have to wait a little bit more to see whether there's gonna be repeat business. Um, the novelty has definitely, you know, it was there. So, wow, like a vegan, a vegan menu, uh, we'll, we'll see, you know, time will, time will tell, right? So I think we need to wait another six months. He can save a little bit on the ingredients anyway, probably. Exactly, yeah, right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love food, I love the food industry. I, I speak to a lot of owners all the time, you know, from from farmers to, you know, produce uh, marketers to food, you know, food, and and you could tell like it, they love their business. They love dealing with people. They recognize the importance that food brings to to society and to and to families. Um, they care. They care about about people, right? And and in, in most, you know, most. Um, executives that I talk to, they want to make sure that their food is, is clean and they want, it's healthy and it, it, it helps the overall health you know, of, of individuals. And especially coming from a time of COVID where, yeah, it's like, it's, it's more important than ever. So yeah, it's, uh, it's like, I, I love the industry. Well, the, even if the Food Institute is a commercial organization, I think it's doing tremendous work because we all would like our food to, to be provided more efficiently. That's in everybody's interest. So exactly. good luck with your work. And thank you so much, Brian. Thanks for talking to me today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Charles. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Thanks very much to Brian Choi. Well, I've got just one more interview that I did during CoinGeek's New York conference, and it's with one of the most talked about speakers, Ty Everett, whose project Babbage is a hugely ambitious and exciting idea, and much discussed at the conference. So please join me next week for the lowdown on Project Babbage. Until then, thanks for listening and goodbye. Data is double-edged. Wield it well and build your place in tomorrow. But trust it blindly and risk watching your progress crumble. Because much of the data we rely upon isn't reliable at all. At Enchain, we believe in data, but we put no faith in it. Instead, we build tools that enable enterprises to trust the data upon which they rely. Enchain, data without question.